Yeah, the actual quote in the course is, this course will be believed entirely or not at all. So there's so many games, like when we play horseshoes, or what was it called? Jarts? Was that jarts? Darts? Jarts? Hangman? There's all these different things. It's all, all about coming closer, closer. You get more points for the closer you get. And then Jesus says, you will believe this course entirely or not at all. You won't succeed with 99% or 99.9%. .9%. It relates actually to what we were talking about earlier about bringing the illusion to the truth. For those that try to bring the course into their career and spiritualize their career, it will not, it will not succeed, it will fail. If you try to spiritualize your interpersonal relationships, failure is absolutely guaranteed. If you try to spiritualize your business and use higher and higher divine principles to make a better business, will not succeed, and I guarantee it. If you try to make a better planet and use the course to eliminate starvation and pollution and, and nuclear armaments and you know, heal the ozone layer and save the whales and the seals and, you know, make a perfect world through the Course Principles, even if you try to bring the Kingdom of Heaven to Earth, I'll guarantee you, my 100% guarantee, it will fail. Jesus tells us in the Course, the world I see holds nothing that I want. And the only value that you have for this world is that you pass it by. Be passers-by. That was in the Gospel of Thomas. The shortest teachings we have of Jesus come from the Gospel of Thomas. Be passers-by. You have to give up the values of the world. Give up thinking you're going to improve the world. You're going to change the world. You're going to heal the world. You're going to fix the world. And that's what mysticism is about. That's what Mary Baker Eddy meant, who led the New Thought movement, Ernest Holmes, and on and on, Joel Goldsmith, and on and on and on and on and on. There is no mind in matter. There is no life, truth, substance, or intelligence in matter. You can't bring the truth into the illusion. You can't bring divine mind and divine light into the illusion. You can't spiritualize matter. That's one of the, talk about level confusion. Spirit is spirit and matter is distortion, is projection, and you can't bring spirit into matter. It was, I always talk about the, the mystics, you know, out through, throughout the years and, and Elizabeth Light was the one who came here it was a couple of years ago and she started talking about the Cathars and France and everything and she's like, you people remind me of the Cathars and we're all like, who are the Cathars? You know, we've heard of about the Klingons and the Romulans but we've never, we're, we're Trekkies, but who are the Cathars and when did they live? Well, back in the 12th, 11th century, before St. Francis, I found out that St. Francis was actually inspired by the Cathars lived his whole life, the Cathars, and the Cathars had this belief that the Son of God could never manifest on earth, could never come to earth. You can imagine how popular that was with the Roman Catholic Church. Because if the Son of God can't even come to earth, can't even manifest on earth, sounds a lot like Mary Baker Eddy, you know, divine mind, you know, there's no mind and matter, there's no life, truth, substance, intelligence. They were right on. These were like the early Mary Baker Arians, Baker, <laughs> Baker Eddians, Baker Eddians. These were like early Mary Baker Eddians back in the 11th century. And uh, the Catholic Church was the belief that Jesus died on the cross to suffer for the sins of mankind. Whoops! Their beliefs didn't have room for that because the Son of God could never come to earth, could never even manifest on earth. Because why? You can't bring spirit into matter. Well, what about the virgin birth? Ooh. Christ wasn't born 
all that discussion like with Gary Renard, did, did the masters appear on the couch or not? Was it a virgin birth or did Jesus come this the way all other babies? He didn't come. The Son of God never came to earth. Smoke that in your pipe. <laughs> this was the Cathar's teachings. And of course, if you want to raise the dead and heal the sick, all you have to do is be in that mind. And, and how does that bring an end to all earthly pursuits? When the Spirit inspires you, you know, anything can seem to flow. But it's like what you really start to see is it's all mind. There is no such thing as mind and matter. It's all mind. You are mind, Jesus says, holy mind, purely mind. What about these mind-body-spirit festivals? What about integrating the mind, body, and spirit? It will never happen, ever. You will never integrate mind, body, and spirit. Why? Because the spirit is real. What's Jesus say about the mind? Jesus says in the Course that the mind is the activating agent of spirit. Wow, that's a great high use for the mind. Was the mind designed for mathematics? No. Was the mind designed for history? No. Was the mind designed for science? Newtonian science? No. Quantum? It can, it's getting close. <laughs> but, was it, was it designed for quantum physics? No. <laughs> no, there's no Big Bang, yes. It's like, that's what forgiveness is teaching. Forgiveness is teaching that the separation never happened. Well, if the separation never happened, why would you try to analyze the separation and figure out a way out of the separation by analyzing and breaking apart? and digesting and synthesizing the separation when the Big Bang was just a, a, an impossible idea that was designed as a smokescreen so that you would never know who you are. Really, when we come down to it, it's like if there's no mind and matter, isn't that the most glorious idea that you've ever heard? Because everything that you think is important in this world is, what Shakespeare say? Much ado about nothing. This is a cause for joy. This is a cause for freedom and happiness. And whatever you thought you had to do or make or change in this world to accomplish that happiness, you don't. You know, that's the I need do nothing solution. And it's purely a state of mind. It's not something that is a formula because Jesus doesn't really have a formula for nothing. You know, a formula for escaping nothing. So, what am I supposed to do with myself? You know, do I have a purpose? Yeah. Uh, you know. Well, you know, there's that saying, be still and know that I'm God. Once, once I tasted the stillness, where the monkey mind was gone and the chatter was gone, and I was like, oh my God, this is wonderful. My mind feels so still, I, I can't hear the ego. It's so still, there's not a chatter or a, a chirp there. Then just, just the tasting of that, just the touching upon it, we call it a mystical experience, changes everything. Because all the changes really for you is your mind is free of the shoulds and ought tos and have tos and the must. You know, that part of it goes, you must, today you must, and you should, and you better, and you ought to, and you have to, and all those things that we do out of fear. Like, for example, working. The reason why human beings work is for, to survive, and that's for the survival of the body. And that's because of body identification. But in that stillness, you have like a flash of awareness that you're not the body. Just a flesh. And just with that flesh, you have this experience, 
I'm, I'm not going to ever think that old way again. I'm never going to let anything I seem to do be motivated by fear. I want to be filled with joy, like Khalil Gibran. When you work, work with love. You know, I'm, whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to do it without fear of consequences. Just on the faith that that will guide me surely to happiness. So at some point, after 10 years of university and trying to please here and please everybody, even though, I was, was it Dylan told you, you can't please everyone. You've got to please yourself, your higher self. You've got to please the Holy Spirit and Christ. And, and as soon as I got into that, then my, the whole trajectory of my seemingly life on earth just changed because I was inspired. I was in the spirit of it. And I'd simply, every time I would come to a branching of the road where I would feel fear, I would just pause and say, mm -mm. I'm not going to take, I'm not going to raise a baby finger out of that fear. I don't have to live like that anymore. That's not true living. And then your life, it seems to go in increments because it, to the, it, it's so frightening to the ego to, to disappear, you know, to not be there. So miracles are our way. You know, we're given miracles. They're really these flashes of perception. They really show us, you know, the glory. They show us the potential for the glory. But we have to seemingly take them on. I mean, I, at some point I had to actually go, okay, all right, miracle worker, nothing that I ever read about in college, nothing that my family ever said, oh, you'll grow up to be a miracle worker and, you know, and you'll have many miracles and you'll heal the sick and raise the dead. And there was none of that ever there. But I actually took that on and I said, I said to Jesus, if you want that, or if you're sure you got the right <laughs> one, and he's like, oh yes, I don't make mistakes in my choices. Yes, you are being called as a miracle worker, and it would, you would be humble to accept this. You would be arrogant to deny it. So to me, that, that one choice of mine, just me saying, okay, I am open to being used as a miracle worker was, was the key. And then everything else will be given. The people you need to meet, the books you need to read, anything. You need resources to do your, your happy, joyful function, they'll be there. You need anything. You know, the Holy Spirit will provide, use the symbols, and rush in with all the symbols that you need to fulfill your part perfectly. And all we have to do is have the faith to say yes to that. And that is, is truly our only part, just to say yes to that. Once we come to that glorious realization like of divine principle, and I call that, that's the good stuff. You know, it, it doesn't matter what we seem to go through till we came to this, that glorious oneness moment, that non-duality non moment, where we just know it in the core of our being. And then there's the transfer of the training. It's, it's like the workbook of the Course is like make no exceptions. And, and how glorious to make no exceptions. How glorious to never try to, you know, bring the, the truth into the illusion. We were talking the other day about the moon and the full moon and, and how just everything lights up. I think of that, that movie, Joe versus the Volcano. Spielberg movie where he goes through all these things. Everything seems to be taken away from him. The ship that he's on sinks. He leaves his whole life behind. He believes he has a brain cloud. And so he lets go of everything in his life. And finally, he ends up on this raft and out there floating in the ocean. And then there's that scene where the moon comes up, the big moon. And he just comes off of the raft and just, and he just thanks God. Thank you for my life, because it's just this radiant, vast light, light, and he's just so taken by that. And, and so, when we think of that light, you know, it's the most important thing is just think of just giving everything that's in your mind over to that light. Like giving it over to the light, instead of trying to, like um, Bruce Almighty, with uh, Jennifer Aniston, he, he tries to 
lasso, remember when he used the powers of God, he tries to lasso the moon and he pulls it in closer. He tries to bring the light to earth with his powers, God-given powers. And it sets off the tides and catastrophes all over. That's such a graphic scenario of when we try to bring the truth into the illusion. You know, like the signs on the billboard, got milk? Well, got God? Got light? Don't try to bring it into your personality life. Don't try to bring God to earth. Because God won't fit in planet earth. Don't try to bring the light of truth to your personal life. Don't try to have God manifest a better world for you, a better life, better relationships, more money, more possessions, more skills, more abilities. It ain't going to happen. You can't ask the truth to not be itself and to shrink itself down into illusions and make better illusions. What's the definition of an illusion? Not real. You want better, not real? Or even better, better, not real? Or more, not real? You know, when you start to really realize how deep this teaching is, you should be jumping for joy that you don't have to build anything in your life. You don't have to grow anything. You don't have to achieve anything. You don't have to establish anything. Imagine if we were taught this when we were little kids. You're perfect just as you are. You don't need to get any better. You're, you don't need to improve. You don't need to grow up to, to be something in the future. You are perfect right now. Whew. Oh, thank you. Oh, and that's exactly what, what we're being taught. And if you listen to the messengers, all they're saying is, this is the way my life was. I reached a point of disillusionment and despair. I wanted to check out. I was dissatisfied, even with the Course in Miracles practice. Even with the, the chair that's by the, the river. Thing. That's, the thing. that's a sneaky one. That's a very sneaky one, because I think um, I had these certain ideas, right, about my own awakening. And until those were completely surrendered on such a deep level, then everything, as soon as, as soon as the mind truly chose one purpose, like seriously, thy will be done, then everything came up underneath. Then the container came in. Then the mighty companions came. Then I was able to drop, 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 drop through the fear in my mind because I had the container and I had the cocoon. But before that, I was trying to do just that. I was trying to have a little bit of both. And it got so painful. And I didn't understand it because I was willing. I really felt a willingness. And I really felt like this spiritual calling. But, you know, it happened when it happened. But until the mind completely chooses, there's a struggle. You know, we know what we're doing here. We're dropping, we're, we're removing the obstacles to love's awareness. We don't focus on love, love, love. Everything feels good. We go through the darkness here. And it's so beautiful because we've been given, once the mind is made up, it's like everything comes in to support that awakening. Not the way that we think it was going to be, but everything is there to support it. And does it feel good? No, no. There's, there's a rocky time. There's extreme disorientation. Remember, he does talk about that. Of course, the Miracle students like to forget those parts. But no, there's extreme disorientation. But there's something about walking with those who have walked before, that have gone all the way, and that's what I saw in David. He's he, he took this all the way. It gave me the courage to drop through those dark, dark, fearful places. And to be held, you know, to be held in it, so that it could happen, so that alchemy, that, that transformation could begin to occur. It's just beautiful. But it is serving one purpose. And it is non-compromise, and that's what I saw in you was, okay, you know, I've, I've been all over the world, I've been to all the sacred sites, I've studied with all the spiritual leaders, blah, 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 brought them to town, you know, did all that stuff. was like, no. And this, and I was, I was always kind of upset it was David, too, 
because it was like I always expected my my you know that teacher that would just say here let's go to be look you know look like an Indian guru or something you know. I and there was David, this, this white guy from Cincinnati. You know, it was like oh, I couldn't even I couldn't even conceptualize that. You know what I mean? It was like all the concepts were just being loosened. So it was just yeah. Like, you think of Cincinnati is we're in WKRT <laughs> in Cincinnati. No, no, nothing good can come from Nazareth. <laughs> But the thing about it is, that's, that's beautiful. And, and I would say, it's so funny to think, even you've peopled your world with all these people studying A Course in Miracles. You know, the ego projected out everything of time and space. You know, even the people around the world that are studying the Course is part of the fragmented perception. Even the people, even the gurus and the saints and all the ones that are so-called enlightened. I was just saying, you know, you'll never hear from an enlightened master that there are those that are enlightened and those that are unenlightened. Because enlightenment is a unified experience. If, if you experience it, then everything and everyone in your universe that you perceive has to be the same. So there's no duality. And all of this comes to a head in really starting to just have that experience and realize that you can't bring it to the world, you know, in terms of, I've had people that write to me, what about our fragmented course community? And I'm saying, it's, what, what's, what perception has a fragmented course community? There's not a fragmented course community. You start to see all perceptions of things, even relating to the course, all are part of what you have to let go of. You know, in the end, you know, that's where the, the path is not in form, it's an experience of mind. And you have to let go of absolutely everything that seemed to come before it. Which makes you universal, which, which makes you, what's the tenth characteristic of a teacher of God? Open-mindedness. That's the, that's the ultimate. So you're not ever getting hung up on words or metaphors or what people believe in or what they don't believe in. And all the stuff of hierarchies hierarchies of energy, you know, hierarchies of, of avatars and minds. You know, it's like that's the, that's the glory.